my thumb in it and just hold my thumb in place like that and then I'll just work my way all the way around it. Oh. <clears throat> just like that. And if it comes through the back, uh, just kind of work your way around it. Get it all the way in. There you go. Looks good. That's my you can also change the plastic pieces over, but I can tell you if you have a hard time doing those, those are nearly impossible. <laughs> So, so try it like this. Try just squeezing it so you can like expose the lip like that and then get it in. Once you get it in, I'll like hold my thumb there to hold it in place and then I'll work my way all the way around. Okay. I see what you mean. See that? You could develop a new piece of equipment that automatically puts that in. You know, you just put the mouthpiece in or in. Yeah. Done. Yeah, it's almost like the things that take on and off tires, you know? <laughs> yeah, there you just go. like pop it, right. out, pop it out. So make sure on the other side it's not pushing through. Okay, looks good. What's important about these washers is a lot of people will try and take it off, stick it on that lip, and screw it in. And the problem with that is if this thin little lip gets smashed, you have a leak pretty much. So the best way to do it is just to keep it in its little home, just like that. And then you'll take the regulator and you'll line up the holes. Most importantly, these two holes on the bottom, if they're lined up with the little tabs, then when you screw it in, it should seat right into um, the three little holes there. So just hold it there. You can start screwing this side. Sorry. That's okay. So as soon as you get that in contact, you can even just kind of look underneath, make sure the holes are lined up, it looks like they are, and then you can just hold it in place, and then you can tighten this all the way down, and you'll see it seat right inside uh, of the gasket. Yeah. And then just turn this until you get a nice, like, snug um, fit. So, yeah, as tight as you can get it. Obviously, we're not trying to crank it down. Yeah. Um, but you want it tight enough so you don't see any gaps on either side of the washer. So that looks good. We'll just leave that like that. And then right now the main valve is open or closed, so we'll go ahead and open that up. So we have a little tool here. Go ahead. And you're going to turn it towards you. Make sure to open it all the way until it closes. Before I open it, should we make sure that this is... Oh, this no, because this is the valve we're going to be regulating from. Sure. And we're not... It shouldn't have the bar pressure set yet. Okay. Um, even though it looks like it actually does, so we'll turn that all the way to the left, make sure there's no bar pressure. You might hear a quick little turn out. So when you open this, you want to make sure it's all the way open, because even though the valve is sensing the pressure, uh, the flow could be compensated a little bit. So we'll just turn it until it locks, and then it looks like... Yeah, we got nothing, so we just got to get that up to yes. between five and seven. So we'll get it right there about six. And then we'll just set it like that. So the best thing to do is like you set it up with the parvo cart, you can even tape this off so that doesn't go out of range and you don't have to play with it until the tank's empty. It comes with about 2000 PSI. It'll start failing calibrations around 200. Uh, the tank should be good for about a year. It just depends on how much testing you guys are doing. So we'll just kind of watch it periodically when you guys are testing. If we see that it's, you know, leaking or you're losing gas um, quicker than you should be, uh, we'll make note of it because it could potentially be a regulator issue. Um, I'm thinking not, but we'll just uh, keep our eye on it. Locked, it shouldn't come out. When you want to pull it out, you have to press down the press fitting and then mm -hmm. pop it out. Pop it in shouldn't stick. Make sure you feel it click mm -hmm. and you should be good. And that's it. If you just go back actually really quick, every tab that you click on is going to basically open up a whole new workflow. So if you ever get lost, just click home. It'll bring you back home and everything that you basically need to be familiar with should be right here. Um, all you're really going to be playing with on a daily basis is the calibration and then the database and testing. But really quick, if sometimes the CPET will actually lose communication with the computer when you shut everything down. So just to make sure that we, our communication is established, we can really quickly go to utility, device manager, 
and it looks like we're connected, we'll just click on show. And once it shows the serial number, we're good. You can just press save. Perfect. We'll just click home again, or you can go back either way. And then we'll go into the calibration tab. Perfect. So uh, there is kind of a lot of things here, but you don't need to be super concerned with everything. Calibration archive is just if you want to pull up an old calibration um, from a previous date. Control panel is just more kind of system diagnostics. You don't need to be worried about it. And then depending on whether or not we're going to calibrate through a mixing chamber or just through the bi-directional turbine. So if we're doing breath by breath, we have to calibrate here. If we're doing mixing chamber, we calibrate here. Um, so right now we're going to do the gas, so we'll just go to the gas calibration. Uh, a somewhat misleading here because yes, the system does need to do an air calibration, but when you just click on the air calibration by itself, uh, that's just to check to make sure the airway valve that samples atmospheric gas is working properly and it's not occluded for any reason. So we're not going to actually go into room air calibration because when we do metabolic calibration, it's it's called a reference gas tank because it's referencing atmospheric gas, so it's a two-point calibration. So it's going to jump back and forth between sampling the two gases. So just so you know, don't worry about the air calibration. It's just the metabolic ergo. So we can go ahead and press start here. Directions. So it gives us a few directions um, saying what to do with the sampling line and um, you know setting the bar pressure and things like that. <clears throat> You do get reference percentages. You're probably never going to change those. Uh, right now, the research and literature uh, says that if you're going to be testing through the course of the day, you can do two calibrations. So once first thing in the morning and then once about midday. Uh, the first calibration in the morning, you'll just leave this box checked. It's just a pre-calibration warm-up. But if you're doing your second calibration, you can just uncheck it. It's just nothing's going to be different. It's just going to take three minutes longer. So uh, you can uncheck it. I've already calibrated, so that's fine. And so uh, we need a sampling line. So we're going to have to plug in our turbine and our sampling line before we push forward. Perfect. So um, there's two turbines here. Why would we not use this one? That's for a small child. This is for an adult. That's a little bit fine. What else would this be used for? Something with lower levels of ventilation, maybe? RER. There you go. RMR. Um, RMR. RMR. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so if we were to calibrate this, we'd have to indicate the size of the turbine. So that one's 28 millimeters, this one's 18. Um, <clears throat> we're not calibrating the flow meter yet, it'll show us, but since we have the sampling lines connected, obviously that's the one that we're going to grab. If you ever needed to switch the sampling lines, you can switch them between each other, it doesn't matter. Just make sure you have the appropriate turbine for the test that you're running. Perfect. So, following the directions, one, make sure it's between five and seven. Mm -hmm. I've got 2,000 PSI, and it is at 2,000 mm -hmm. between five and seven. Um, and then the next step would be to plug these in yep. on a seat And they have their little respective names. So green goes with green mm -hmm. for the turbine. And this goes in the sampling line for the sampling. And it's a special twist. Yeah, so you remember I said kind of do a half spin counterclockwise and then spin it counterclockwise. Uh, if you just spin it straight on, it'll put tension in the line, and if it unwinds itself during the test, obviously you're not going to get any data. That's secure, that's secure. Um, cool. So that's good. Directions, take out the sampling line mm -hmm. and start it here. Sampling port, yep. Okay, and then... We may have missed one thing, though. I don't think we actually turned the gas on. Ah, so I need to... Move that lever to parallel. Yep. And lever. Open. This one's nice because some of our old regulators don't look like this, but then you'll still get this diagram. So it could be kind of misleading, but for you guys, it's pretty straightforward because it's the same regulator. So um, that should be okay. <clears throat> and then remember when it's calibrating, just step back and um, I mean you don't need to actually step back but um, it's not going to explode on you but um, if you're like you know if you 
are holding your hand here, or you bump into it and shake it, uh, the nitrogen orbs in the oxygen sensor will start bouncing around and it'll say the oxygen is unstable if there's too much movement. So, um, I mean, a little movement's fine, but too much and it'll exit out. So now you can see in the blue is our oxygen percentage and then red is our CO2 for the atmospheric gas. And then it'll jump back and forth a couple times. So you see if you actually touch it a little bit, you'll see it shake around. That's not enough for it to be unstable, but uh, Jake wasn't, wasn't happy with that. <clears throat> so there's, <clears throat> I guess there's one, there's like three or four potential things that could cause you to fail. So one, um, there's less than 200, or 200 PSI or less inside of the actual gas tank. Two, uh, the bar pressure is not set appropriately. <clears throat> Three, the uh, the sampling line could be bad. Uh, so these, it seems like these sample lines um, are still good. I mean, most of them were bagged up and you guys weren't really using them. So that kind of saves the life expectancy of them a bit. But uh, there are a hundred tests or six months. So if they're exposed to the environment for six months, uh, they'll go bad after six months. Um, or 100 tests, like I said. So uh, those are three of the main reasons the gas will be unstable when you'll fail calibration. Or um, that's kind of just like the main things. Anything further than that, it's usually a little bit more technical, but those are just the three main things you want to look out for. And then actually, yeah, it, the sampling line where it plugs into obviously could potentially not be plugged in completely which it's not, actually. Victoria. All right. That's okay. So inserting it more in? Yes. Red, and then the corresponding number would be in red as well. Uh, the best thing to do, if it fails one time, uh, you can just hit factory settings, or you could cancel it, or you can hit factory settings and reset the factory settings. You'd really only need to do that if you accept a failed calibration. So I would just click cancel and then run it again. Mm -hmm. uh, if it fails two times in a row, obviously there's an issue. You're going to want to call in technical support. But if it failed once and then it passed, I would run it again. If it passed three times, then okay, you should be fine. But just kind of make note of it that it did have a fail and just, you know, just make note of it. Um, okay, so everything looks fine. We can just press OK. Uh, we'll just go back. We're going to calibrate for, or I guess we'll calibrate both for the mixing chamber and breath by breath. But first, we'll just uh, set it up for breath So at this by time, breath. though, we should turn, turn the valve on. off right yep. in the back. For the gas, yes. Yeah. Perfect. So yeah, let's set up for the flow meter calibration. 
And this doesn't have directions, does it? Uh, I think it just tells you. We'll find out. Um, yeah, I, I can't even remember. <laughs> Uh, I think it just has you select the size of the flow meter, and then, yeah, that's it. As soon as it's green, it's good to go. Um, so, yeah, just uh, set up. Yeah, that syringe is a little sticky, so you're going to want to break it in a bit. <clears throat> Perfect. So, um, here's our percent of error. Uh, looks really good to me. Uh, if anything popped up and was a fail, it would be in red, just like with the gas calibration. Uh, so with this, looks fine. There's really nothing else to it. So we'll just go ahead and click yeah. accept. Time, and it's going to pop up in terminal mode. Uh, there's three different modes. Uh, there's like terminal, analog, and there's a manual. Mm -hmm. uh, terminal is the one that we want to be running on. So once it's set to terminal, everything's zeroed out. We're good there. We'll come over here and we'll press start. We'll select a flow meter, 28 millimeters. And then right here, uh, we're just going to pick maximal effort because if we pick submax, it's automatically going to uh, basically end the test when the person gets to their predicted heart rate value, which we all know that's not really what we're after. So um, I'll leave it at maximal, data filtering none, because we'll do our filtering later. The subject is healthy. Uh, it'll draw basically all, it, all its predicted equations from ACSM. Uh, with, if you pick clinical, it's going to be ATS, ERS, um, American Heart Association, things like that. Uh, the ergometer that we're selecting. <clears throat> Don't just pick Excalibur because that's not going to work. It needs to be Excalibur Sport Device 1. So it should be defaulted to that and it should always pop up. Um, we'll just stick you in like a 20 watt ramp. Um, what do you think, 20, maybe 15? She's a beast. Yeah, okay, perfect. And 25. We, we don't yeah. even have to do the whole task, so that's fine. Yeah, we'll just get some data. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so the port for the ergometer is in the metabolic cart. That's um, automatic. Uh, do we want to record some ECG or do we want to do regular heart rate? Um, what do you guys think? Did you guys do ECG with that test you ran? Yeah. And it was fine? Uh -huh. Are you okay with it? Are you comfortable? Yeah. I think we're all right without we're ECG then. Okay. Yeah, we're um, so if you're going to do ECG, PC ECG software. If you're going to wear a heart rate monitor, just click metabolic cart. Do that. We'll leave it at that because once we press OK, it's going to start. So let's just get the heart rate monitor strap on you, uh, the subject, until I'm at this point. Then I'll put on the mask. I'll get all of this stuff configured just so they're not sitting around kind of waiting. Um, but then we have everything. It all looks good here. We'll go ahead and press OK. And it's going to, uh, you can see right here it says record. So we're going to start collecting some data, but we're not going to actually record it. Uh, it's kind of just a feature of the soft equivalents, and those things just fall um, as far to baseline as we can possibly get them before we start testing. So looking at it now, she looks, you know, pretty calm and at rest according to the data, although we're not picking up heart rate right now. Um, so I would usually just click record, and it would put us into the warm-up phase, and we would just let the test run. Uh, but we'll just, instead of hitting record, we'll just let it run. I want to get a signal from this heart rate receiver. Isn't it right there? 76. Where? On the bottom. Oh, it is picking it up there, but it's not giving it to us up oh, top oh, for oh. some reason. Hmm. Defunct heart rate. That wouldn't be one derived from ECG, would it? Are they separate, you know, uh, panels? You know what? It could be. I've never seen that before, though. But that that could be something. I'll I'll ask and I'll mm -hmm. see what the deal is. Okay. Yeah, I don't know, but it looks like we're picking up a good heart rate now. So we'll just let uh, this run, and once the two minutes is run, so we're at we have 15 seconds to go. 
all of this data that's currently on here will drop. None of that's been recorded and everything will start over. So this will be at zero, all this will be at zero, there'll be no data here. <clears throat> so we'll just let it run a couple more seconds. Perfect. Uh, so we're still just in the warm-up phase, so um, or in the rest phase actually. So we'll just let it go. This is this was built into the protocol this, ahead of time. If we would have looked at the yes. different protocols, mm -hmm. right? And all the protocols that are currently in place, you can edit those protocols, mm -hmm. or you can duplicate them and then edit them, or you can just build a custom one from scratch. Okay. So as soon as uh, <clears throat> it goes from rest phase to warm up, I'll have you start pedaling and it'll just be unloaded at zero watts. And then once we um, jump into the actual test, um, it's going to go up uh, 20 watts a minute. So you can see as I switch through these panels, the tabular data that we're getting on the side is different because uh, when you go in the settings and you customize certain um, views and reports, you can just change and customize it however you want. When we finish here, I'll show you guys how um, you can do that. <clears throat> and even these graphs, if we didn't like care about looking at these graphs as our main dashboard, you can come up here and click on these three and you can edit the chart however you'd like. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How did you get it to jump up every five watts? What was that? How did you get it to jump up every five watts? Oh, so it's it's not jumping every five watts. It's just, it's only telling us every five watts. So it's like, it's changing every second, um, but it's not gonna give us like decimal values for, for that. Because if you think 25 watts a minute, if, if you divide that by 60 seconds, uh. it could be point something. It's not going to indicate that on the, the display board. There's probably a way to change it, but that's within the Lodi settings. Uh, it wouldn't be through here, so I'm not sure. <clears throat> How does that feel? Good? Mm -hmm. The bike's working right? You feel like getting harder? Yeah. Okay. I moved up on the seat. Oh. Oh, it looks like you're kind of in a better position now. Mm -hmm. So if you were wanting to input um, systolic, diastolic blood pressures mm -hmm. or any other marker that we're mm -hmm. looking at, is there a way to input it as we are moving through the test? Yeah, so <clears throat> when we were um, at the beginning, when we were indicating uh, the protocol that we were choosing, the bike and everything, and what you know phases of exercise, or when we picked maximal and everything like that, mm -hmm. at the bottom it allows you to choose if you want to take blood pressure or not. Okay. I hit no, hmm. so we can't input it, but mm -hmm. you just click yes, and you will have a window to input those values. Okay. Yeah. Is there a way to make custom values too if we're wanting to input? Like if you want to input what, them at yeah. different stages? Or like uh, uh, a non-blood pressure, you know, a miscellaneous. Let's say we're taking measurements of a third-party device, but we want to add it at this particular moment of the test. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I do. So you mean like if you're going, you just want to automatic or you want to just take the manual blood pressures and add in Yes, the exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you'll just indicate that you want to take blood pressure, and it'll do that. So since we're not, because you can sync this with a Tango, and it'll mm -hmm. automatically just kick out the signal for it to take it. Mm -hmm. But if you're taking them manually, yeah, you just click yes, and then you'll have access to the bar that'll say syst um, systole and diastole, and you can just put, punch them in there. And we can have... Um any kind of event though so mm -hmm. you know let's say I'm doing uh, we're getting near infrared spectroscopy system and I want to mm -hmm. input something from that device which is not hooked in here mm -hmm. but I want to add what's going on from that device mm -hmm. into this test can mm -hmm. I add a it doesn't sound like it'd be a problem okay perfect it, it'd be fine yeah okay. J just again just make sure that you click that you want to take blood pressure um, okay. before you start the test okay <clears throat> how you feeling mm. 
<laughs> Getting tired? <laughs> What's the events? Uh, so there's, uh, this is for flow volume loops. Oh. I actually, I think basically what it's going to do is you'll take flow volume loops <clears throat> over the course of the test. Mm -hmm. And it's going to basically kick that data into the oscillatory breathing. So if we have somebody that has oscillatory breathing and um, they have their residual volumes increasing through exercise, uh, we'll be able to, you getting Down. done? Recovery, please. Recovery, okay. I need this this morning. Victoria. <laughs> All right, it should be unloaded now. So you, no green this morning. So you hit the uh, recovery <laughs> button. I just hit stop. Oh, okay. um, I just stopped it. If you hit recovery, it'll go into the recovery phase and uh, it'll be unloaded as well and we'll continue to collect okay. recovery data if you wanted to see recovery it data. Kind of Is that still at 100, 100 watts? Oh, it's still at 100, 100, 100 watts. Yeah. So it doesn't yeah, automatically bring it down, down, huh? Oops. If you hit recovery, it it, it's well. still at 90, 190. Yeah. Hmm. How about now? Yes. Okay, so if you click recovery here, it'll kick that signal out to here, but if okay. you click stop, it's not going to kick the signal out. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so once we end the test, this is going to be our main screen here. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that I usually do is I won't touch anything uh, until I kick out the raw data first. So I don't want to do any averaging because I don't want to lose my raw data. So I'll just go save and exit from here. And then from here, I'll automatically just save as Excel. It'll automatically configure the file, I'll just put it on the desktop and we'll, oh, I don't want to do that. We'll just open it up just to see what it looks like, and then we'll go ahead and finish with our editing. Ah, I can breathe. <laughs> Thanks for being the subject. That was good. <clears throat> good job. Uh, perfect. So this is what our raw data file is going to look like. Uh, so I usually always stress to export the raw data and save it somewhere safe. So this is everything. This is everything, yeah. Um, so it kicked out everything for us. That all looks fine. Looks like it's communicating with Excel good. So we finished with exporting the raw data. So now we'll go back to edit. And then now we can do our edit and filtering. So it brought us back to that original page. We'll go edit and filter. And there's three ways uh, you can filter. So there's the smoothing. So it's going to let you smooth it based on points. So I think the smallest number of points it'll let us choose is three, and then you can indicate the amount of steps. So anywhere between three and 15, it's going to smooth out the data for you. What do you usually use? Uh, I use the rolling time average. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a 30 second average, which is if we tested with the mixing chamber in that same test, this is what it would look like automatically. Mm -hmm. um, but the rolling time average updates every 10 seconds. So instead of you just getting an average every 30 seconds, it's basically gonna update the average every 10 seconds. So if you had some sort of discrepancy in the data or some sort of drastic change in less than 30 seconds, you'll be able to pick up on it with that and not just kind of average out the outliers. <clears throat> so. Uh, we'll just keep it at that. That looks fine. We'll just click accept. It's going to say, warning, you've edited the data and filtered it. Um, your, the rest of the remaining uh, data will be lost, so that's why I usually stress to export the Excel file first. So we'll click OK. And then now we could just go with our workflow from left to right. So the first thing we're going to do, uh, <clears throat> it's basically trying to auto-detect uh, the highest average VO2 peak. Uh, it's not really doing a very good job at it, so I'll kind of edit it, get a little bit better of a peak. Uh, before it was kind of getting this um, downward slope and it was indicating that your VO2 peak was 34.9 mLs per kg, which that's not true. It was more like uh, 36, somewhere about there. Uh, so we'll just leave that at that. That looks good. Uh, we'll come over to the thresholds tab. Uh, there's three ways that we can determine thresholds here. So we have the V-slope method for determining first threshold. 
uh, ventilatory efficiency, you can determine both thresholds, and then we have the pressures of entitled, where you can kind of verify the ventilatory efficiency and both uh, the thresholds from the two previous methods. So uh, the first thing we can do is we can auto detect to see where the system wants to put it. Uh, I don't really agree with that, so we'll go ahead and throw the 45 degree angle in there. And I'd say maybe somewhere about here. So maybe even down here. So really by definition, first threshold, we're just basically looking for our inflection point. Uh, so I mean, it's pretty clear when you put it up to a 45 degree angle. I mean, sometimes you will have outliers, but for the most part, we do see the inflection point at about 62%. Uh, I guess we could say that that's okay. I mean, it wasn't a maximal effort. You said you didn't eat. I mean, this could obviously change, but um, what do you think, Josh? Okay? It looks fine. pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll go with that. It's nice because when you change things on each one of these threshold graphs, the changes that you make correspond to all the other graphs. So uh, <clears throat> it's nice because you can come over here and maybe look at it and be like, eh, I don't know. So by definition on ventilatory uh, equivalence, we're looking for an inflection point in VEVO2 with no corresponding inflection point of VEVCO2. So it kind of looks like it could be there. It almost looks like it could be way back here, but that's not the case. Uh, it almost looks like you were just adjusting to the protocol a little bit. That's where our true breaking point was, about 71% of the tests that we ran. Um, <clears throat> and then second threshold, it doesn't look like we hit second threshold because we see a pretty um, nice plateau there in VEVCO2. Uh, we would see an inflection of both the, a second inflection of VEVO2 and inflection of VEVCO2. So everything between those two points would be our isocapnic buffering window, and then everything af after would be hypercapnic hyperventilation. So you guys can just adjust those accordingly and decide where you think the two thresholds lie. Um, and then it's nice because if you have a full test start to finish, you'll see that this uh, pressures of entitled graph will correspond very well to the ventilatory efficiency. So you can kind of see this bubbling effect and that's typically what you'll see up to first threshold. You'll see these, uh, it'll kind of bubble out and then you'll see kind of a plateau and then you'll see them kind of converge together. So ventilatory efficiency is at its peak at first threshold and um, kind of in that isocapnic window. And then you'll see it kind of converge together because uh, during the hypercapnic hyperventilation windows, somebody's respiratory fractions are gonna drop because they're gonna start hyperventilating. So you'll kind of see a nice bubble effect um, in a person with a real test. So when you make those changes to the, the V-slope method and the ventilatory efficiency, you should see the two lines kind of corresponding, making a nice kind of bubble. And between those two points, you should see it pretty linear um, for the most part. Uh, it kind of depends on the person, but it'll change from, from person to person. But uh, obviously, if these two graphs, uh, sorry, let me go back real quick. If the thresholds are off on these two graphs, they're gonna correspond here, and it should be pretty obvious um, that something doesn't look right. Uh, I don't know if you guys are super familiar with looking at these two graphs. Um, Dr. Cotter? No. Nope. Not even you? Nope. Um, so yeah, uh, there's a lot of research and papers out there if you guys want some more information on utilizing those graphs for thresholds. I don't know if you guys are gonna really be doing that, but um, you can do that here. And then you can see this, this graph here, uh, it's just a default, it's just heart rate versus power, lactate versus time. Um, so that looks fine, we'll just kind of leave it at that. Leave it at that. But the VEVCO2 slope, it's cool because the application based on Wasserman is basically just collecting data from the start of the test to the anaerobic threshold. And a slope that's measured above 30 is indicating some sort of cardiac ischemia or left ventricular dysfunction. So basically the angle of the slope is just indicating that CO2 is being produced at a rate much quicker than we're delivering oxygenated blood. And yeah, obviously that always happens during the course of an exercise test, but it wouldn't be happening um, the slope wouldn't be that steep between the start of the test and first threshold because it should be a nice or you know a nice smooth ramp to max. It shouldn't be just like all of a sudden we're producing all sorts of CO2. 
Um, and then the oxygen uptake efficiency slope will correspond well to that. Um, you should just see a linear increase from start to finish in a healthy subject. That's just indicating that, yeah, they're taking up oxygen through the course of the entire test. If you see a plateau or a drop in like a cardiac clinical patient, you would see that because there could be some cardiac ischemia or some infarction of some sort. Um, obviously, you'd have that person hooked up to an EKG and you wouldn't just be testing them in like an education lab, so I don't think you guys will run into those people too much. Um, and then the oscillatory breathing, that kind of just corresponds with both of these graphs. So if somebody were to have um, some sort of small airway trapping or if they had like emphysema or something like that during the course of the test their residual volumes are starting to increase so all of a sudden there's tons of CO2 sensed at the alveoli they'll start hyperventilating they'll blow off that CO2 they'll kind of come back to baseline they'll produce a bunch of CO2 again they'll blow it off so you'll see this kind of um, like a staggering graph almost like the points uh, the peaks will be very staggered from each other. And that'll just kind of indicate he produced a lot of CO2, he hyperventilated, blew it off, kind of got back to baseline. But you'll see that trend throughout the course of exercise. So uh, that looks fine, that actually looks perfect. It's nice and smooth and that's what we wanna see in a healthy subject. Uh, so that all looks good. Uh, I'll just auto detect it and that's fine. Uh, this is the delta work rate, delta VO2. I'll just auto detect this one as well. Uh, it's giving us an O2 pulse, um, which is a good indicator of stroke volume, uh, and then it's basically just giving us our VO2 versus power. Uh, you know, there's, I guess, a little bit of application here. It's showing us the correlation between the two graphs, and then it's showing um, what your delta work rate was, and then it's not giving us an absolute number, but it looks like you're about 12 mLs per beat. So seems good for you know, healthy girl your age so it's, it's normal <laughs> it's normal <laughs> um, 12 mls you mean 12 liters no 12 mls of oxygen oh yeah so it's not the same as the stroke volume so it's the with each beat not how much blood came out but how much ox oh, how much saturation or how much oxygen was in that amount of blood that was delivered so that's the two pulse um, and that's just calculated based off of the subject's VO2 max. It's just VO2 divided by heart rate is O2 pulse. <clears throat> um, and then we get some flow volume loops. Um, not quite sure um, what you guys are going to use it for because you have to do spirometry to get some true values. Uh, but we will get some flow volume loops here. I'm not super huge on the application for it, but it's kind of similar to when you take your flow volume loops, you basically... Uh, once you do um, some spirometry stuff, it'll give you a summary saying that, you know, through the course of your test, based on, you know, your inspiratory capacity, your functional residual capacity and things like that, how much, um, basically, it's not really giving you a residual volume number, but how are those numbers changing during the course of the test because your residual volume number is changing. Uh, so um, that's pretty much it for that. Um, and then once we kind of streamline through the overview all the way through these graphs and everything seems good, uh, we can just finalize our report. So we can say the reason for stopping the test was just, oh, no, not post cardiac surgery. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, we'll just say none. So when we generate the report, the numbers that it's drawing for our conclusions are all from the ACSM guidelines, so you can see that there. Um, it's saying that you're in the 64th percentile, you didn't go to max, so we're not worried about that. Um, but it's just basically taking all the numbers and building an interpretation based on those formulas. So uh, we could go save and exit from here, or you can enter your operator comments, whatever you want to do. And it wants uh, six full respiratory cycles, just like the other one, but you're not going to see um, inspiratory flow. You're only going to see the expiratory flow. So using the dongle, we have 28 millimeter turbines. Yep. And, oh, directions. There they are. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. And. 
So the green light's on, so you're good to go. Perfect. Zero percent error. What? Woo! That's a record. <laughs> um, perfect. So just like the other setup, uh, just click accept and it will accept that calibration. And at this point, we're ready to run a test. So that. Okay. And so we'll just need to swap out the turbine. So if you want to go ahead and do that. That. <laughs> Bob Turbide. <laughs> yeah, we can continue. Alright, so. Can I take out the um, auxiliary cord for the, tur for the loading now? Um, yeah, but you don't have to. Okay. You can just leave it. But this, I do need to remove. Yeah, so with the turbine, it's has that little ethernet, it's an ethernet cord, so you have to push the tab up. Um, those things, they're, yeah, if you just force them, they could potentially break. All right, let's make sure the sampling line is in this time. <laughs> this is your test. Clockwise, Dr. clockwise, Shen. clockwise. Did it feel better that time? Yes. Okay. But I do want to ask Kai if, if that's properly inserted. It's tight, but I just—it felt like that last time. But yeah, that seems okay. fine. Um, so last time, I think when you did it, you just push it on and you screwed it, which it will seem like it's on there. But there's two rivets, so right now it's kind of loose. So just make sure you press it all the way down on there, and then tighten it down. And yeah, you had it fine though that time, so right. you should be okay. Yep. Make sure the little uh, tab is facing down. Perfect. <clears throat> Perfect. So let's just, since we have it set up, let's just recalibrate the syringe or recalibrate <coughs> the turbine. Zero percent error rate. You've set the yeah. standard. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. I've yet to get myself a California shirt. You know, with the bear on it. Yeah. Do you, don't you like this one? It's nice. This is actually kind of the only shirt that I like at the bookstore. Oh, really? Oh, it's a Long Beach one. So this one, you see the scaling's way different because the level of flow is so much smaller. So with this one, even though it doesn't really matter what speed you plunge it, people will typically plunge it a little bit slower, but it doesn't really matter. So this one only wants two full respiratory cycles, um, and you have a 0.03% error, so mm -hmm. pretty close, but not right on. <laughs> Um, yeah, so you're good. The calibration passed. It would pop up in red, um, oh. like I said before, so you're good. You can just click accept. I'm ready for a test now. So if we wanted to just run a test with a mask, we would just pop in the smaller adapter, and then you would put the turbine right onto the mask, and you would just run a test um, as usual. Uh, in the case of running the canopy in the blower, We'll get that set up right now so we can see what that looks like. Okay. If we kind of X out the metabolic data collection, then it's just going to be the uh, ECG software communicating directly to the ergometer. So uh, the way we'll do that is we'll come over here, we'll go to stress ECG. With the resting ECG, you guys don't even really need to use that. 
because you can collect resting data with the stress application, but with the resting application, you can't use protocols and things like that for actual stress tests. Bit of a simplified version of the, of it, this exactly. exercise, okay. Yeah. Um, so you can just go right here to the setup hammer. Now we're gonna go to the environment tab and you're gonna go to metabolic cart control. And what you're going to do is you're just going to unclick the metabolic cart control. Hmm. And what you would do is you would plug in your ergometer auxiliary RS-232 cord right into the back of the computer. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll just leave this like this for now. Press OK. So that's into the computer instead of the cart. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yep. got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. So the ergometer is here. We would just go to TrackMaster. Um, so it's not going oh. to be this V1.2. Okay. Um, I don't even know why that's there, because there's no application for it. Um, it's just TrackMaster in kilometers an hour or miles an hour. So it just depends on which one this is. Yeah, right. it depends okay. what that's set in. Okay. So since the Motara is completely in control of that TrackMaster, you'll uh -huh. have to see through the software what the units of measure is. Okay. Sure. Um, and then what you'll do is you'll just unplug the auxiliary cord from the back of the TrackMaster, plug it right into the back of okay. the CPET, just like the That's loading, great. Okay. and you should be good to go. Okay.